what's key is that if we compare these two guys, they're, they're equal in every respect, in age, and de right down to their sunglasses, okay? But, but they differ in their skin, skin color, and the man on the right is going to take about five to six times as long to make vitamin D in his skin under intense sun conditions. So let's say here at the winter solstice, January, outside in Johannesburg, these two guys are outside. This one will take about five to six times as long to make vitamin D in his skin as the guy on the left. Now, this is not a problem if you're living outside, if you're spending a lot of time outside. Uh, dark skin is not any problem for making vitamin D. But what happens if you go to a different location or you spend time indoors? And that's what I want to get to now. Because we can think about what happened as humans, as some human populations started to live, leave Africa and disperse to, to lower UVB climbs around the globe, that they would have faced some problems with slow vitamin D production, with serious health problems, and we see, again, the mechanism, the grounds for the mechanism for natural selection to actually lose pigmentation. <coughs> and what we have been able to document, and here I'm using the royal we because I'm talking about some of my colleagues at Penn State who are extremely clever and capable geneticists who have been looking at the evolution of depigmentation. And what they've been able to discover is that uh, Western Europeans, of which my graduate student here is a good example, uh, have highly depigmented skin as a result of one particular set of mutations that was under strong positive selection as people dispersed into <laughs> Northwestern Europe. And these, these mutations have been given these fairly horrible names mm -hmm. that don't roll off the tip of the tongue, but suffice it to say that there were specific genetic mutations that were unique to Northwestern Europeans that allowed them to be depigmented and that <coughs> then made it easier for them to produce vitamin D in their skin under low UVB conditions. Now, what is so interesting here is that we have other lightly pigmented people on Earth. Here in Northeastern Asia, lots of lightly pigmented people who underwent independent genetic changes to achieve depigmentation. These two groups of modern humans underwent independent genetic changes or mutations to create depigmented skin that could catalyze vitamin D formation easily under reduced UV conditions. Was I excited when I heard about this? Of course, this is an example of, of natural selection working beautifully, independently, in two evolutionarily rather distinct lineages that have been separated from one another for about 20,000 years, independently evolved lightly pigmented skin. And, boy, have any of you been keeping up with the advances in the Neanderthal genome? This is really wild stuff and really excellent, exciting modern paleoanthropology. The geneticists have been able to actually look at the <coughs> DNA sequences of some Neanderthal bones, and they were able to discover that some of the genes that coded for skin pigmentation would have produced lightly pigmented skin in Neanderthals. So Neanderthals, who are our distant cousins, we've only shared a last common ancestor with them about 500,000 years ago, when they dispersed also into Central Europe and Western Asia, they evolved depigmented skin also. So let's revisit our hairy timeline, which has all, all of a sudden got a lot more complex. Because here, with the origin of modern humans around 100,000 years ago, we see independent evolution of depigmentation twice in Europeans and East Asians. And back here, this ancient relative, the Neanderthal, also evolved depigmentation. That is just, as far as I'm concerned, as an as a anthropologist, just too cool for words. So we can really think about 
now sort of a, a coherent picture of, of skin pigmentation being an evolutionary compromise between the demands of protection against intense ultraviolet radiation at the equator and conducing for the photosynthesis of vitamin D under reduced ultraviolet conditions, ultraviolet B conditions, closer to the poles. And in this way, this is one of the best examples, the best visible examples on each one of our bodies of natural selection acting on humans. And this is why I want you to teach evolution um, by using skin pigmentation. Many, many people uh, ask me, how can I give a good lesson to my students about the action of natural selection? I said, you're walking around with the best, the best evidence in the world, your skin. Skin pigmentation is a superb example. Use it to teach evolution. Now, one of the interesting things about modern humans is that they haven't stayed put, and we've moved around a lot. My, my mother used to say, I had a loose foot. Well, lots of humans have had loose feet over the years. And what we've seen in the last 500 years especially is that there have been tremendous movements of modern people over great distances as air and sea transportation has become more efficient, faster. Now, what has this meant in terms of our skin and its match to the environment. In many of these cases, we have darkly pigmented people going to, to areas with low UV. We have lightly pigmented people going to areas with high UV. And we see a real mismatch occurring between skin and environment. And of course, those were just voluntary migrations. One of the most significant involuntary migrations in the history of the world was the transatlantic slave trade. Just one example, a massive example, of, of involuntary movements of people, in this case, equatorial Africans from a variety of different locales, going into Europe in small numbers, but into the New World, into the Caribbean in large numbers, in North America and South America, and into many environments that had much lower UV conditions. So today, in Johannesburg, today, here on the subway in New York City, what we have are tremendous mixtures of people from all over the place. And especially in, in the United States, Everyone has arrived there, most everyone, at least in this picture, has arrived there, their ancestors have, in the last 200 years. People of moderate, dark, and light pigmentation, all living in a low UV environment. Now, if everyone were spending time outside, let's say if everyone were farmers, all of these individuals could probably make plenty of vitamin D in their skin to satisfy their physiological needs and stay healthy and reproduce in a healthy way. But how many people are farmers in New York City? Okay, Not very many. People are living like this. People spend time indoors. The very nature of modern urban life is indoor life. People who spend a lot of time indoors have major problems making enough vitamin D in their skin. And if they have darkly pigmented skin, it is even more difficult because it means that even during the course of casual outdoor sun exposure, they probably out, aren't outdoors long enough to make the vitamin D that they need. This is one of the reasons why vitamin D deficiency is rife in South Africa. Not only because many people have darkly pigmented skin, but because people spend a lot of time indoors. Of course, there are people with lightly pigmented skin who also suffer the consequences of a mismatch between their skin and the environment. And this poor, unfortunate guy simply illustrates 
uh, an increasing problem, not just with painful sunburns, but with skin cancer, especially among people who take long vacations in the sun or who have moved to a sunny locale from a not very sunny it's, it's salutary to remember that most of our ancestors never moved very far. They would only move perhaps 10 or 50 kilometers at most during the course of their lives. They never went on vacation. <coughs> Lucy, Homer or Gaster, Turkanaboy, they never went to Tenerife or any exotic locale. They stayed close to home. We don't, and we pay the price for the fact that we live far away from our ancestral homes or spend vacation times away. So when we think about this, this beautiful sepia rainbow of skin color, we can understand the extremes now very well. We've got very darkly pigmented people in, in high UV areas, very lightly pigmented people in very low UV areas. And in between, we have moderately pigmented people who are capable of tanning. And we see many people uh, here in the, in the southern part of South Africa, in North America, in Southeast Asia, we see many moderately pigmented people who are able to develop a deep, rich tan in the presence of summer sunlight that's rich in UV, and they then lose the tan in the winter months. We also, also very, very importantly, find examples of darkly pigmented, highly tannable skin that has evolved secondarily. This is one of the most interesting areas of skin evolution studies, is the study of peoples who have under, undergone repigmentation in the course of their evolutionary history. On the left here, we have a young man who is East African, who has rich eumelanin pigmentation protecting him from equatorial sun. We have an Australian Aboriginal man and a Southern Indian man. These two also have a lot of eumelanin pigmentation that was produced by independent genetic mutations that occurred in their ancestors as they moved from areas of lower UV to higher UV. In other words, in the course of human dispersals, as some populations went from low UV to high UV areas again, we see repigmented skin evolving. And so this is, this is really, I can't help but use the word, word cool. This is cool stuff. And it's evolutionarily and socially important <coughs> stuff. Because the fact that similar skin colors have evolved independently multiple times under similar environmental conditions means that skin pigmentation is one of the most labile features, the most flexible, changeable, subject to change features in evolution. And it makes a lot of sense. For most of our history, we had naked skin. Skin that was our primary interface between our inside environment and our outside environment. Skin has to protect us not only from, from wind, cold, moisture, pathogens. It has to protect us from ultraviolet radiation. It has been the very <coughs> interface. It has been the thing that has been most subject to intense natural selection. Immanuel Kant is known for many, many important uh, philosophical treatises that, that form the foundation for modern critical reasoning. But he also is known, at least in, in my circle of acquaintances, as one of the world's most influential racists. Mm -hmm. Because Kant, in 1785, established four different groups of humans. He took Linnaeus, some of Linnaeus's elements and he put them, he, he rearranged them. He defined Europeans, Asians, Africans, and Americans. And he said, these groups are immutable. They can never change. They, have, they were formed as a result of specific proximity to Central Europe. And they had specific physical traits, and specific traits of character, behavior, and culture. Now, 
What was different about Kant was that for the first time, he arranged these groups in a hierarchy. Because he said they weren't equal. Linnaeus never really created a hierarchy, but Kant did. And in 1785, he put, surprise, surprise, Europeans on top, full of, of all of the attributes of high civilization. Asians, he put second, because he said, well, they have certain physical attributes that are different, but they're also capable of creating a high civilization. With Africans and Native Americans, he put them in lower rungs, basically saying that they were incapable of developing civilization. And this is why we suffer today. Kant was a very influential man. By the time he published in 1785, he was already a very famous and respected philosopher. And what he had to say influenced other philosophers and naturalists. And these men, they didn't have Twitter, they didn't have Facebook, but they published books, influential treatises that were read by teachers and scholars all around the world. What does this mean for us? It means that we can bring this story of skin color evolution and the story of how people erroneously and fallaciously placed each other in different, in different categories and then ranked the categories according to quality. We can see that this was a mistake. Knowing this, we can play the tape backward, or at least we can create a new tape. A new tape in which education of all of our children can include the study of human evolution, can include the study of human skin color evolution, can include the study of how people came into contact with one another through history and created erroneous classifications of one another that were full of deep and misleading meaning and we can truly start afresh. But this is something in which none of us is a spectator. We must all be participants. And I'm asking you tonight to be a participant, everyone, in this process of engaging with your fellow human beings to talk more about this difficult but important part of the human condition. We are beautiful. We are one people, but we must all, through act of will, through strong will and motivation, we can change. We can fight racism, and we can become truly one people. I want to thank especially my husband, George Chaplin, for his tremendous support and collaboration over the years. I want to thank past a tremendous organization that's doing wonderful things for the study of origin sciences and much more in Africa specifically, as well as Standard Bank for their generous support of this lecture. And I thank you very much for this most generous opportunity to, to have me here. And I hope that you can take a little bit back with you in your heart and mind and infect other people. Thank you very much.